Coming to you live from our studios in Blee City, this is the Evening News on Love Television for Monday, July 18th. To start things off, we'll take a look at the top stories for today. Tonight, the news and sentiments of the beheading of a member of the religious community has swarmed the social media and news blogs since Friday night. In this newscast, we will tell you of the five suspects in this murder and how their attorney got them released late this evening. The plot thickens in the unprecedented find of a human head as one of the suspects have been found to bear various identities. We'll take you through what has been found out and what was presented in the National Security Press Conference earlier today. Also in our news, a young girl from Maypen Village is dead following her encounter with a crocodile. Mexican government has announced the deployment of a forensic expert to Belize in the investigation of the young Guatemalan boy's death in the Chicabul. And there is a story of the almost $30,000 stolen from the Income Tax Department. An eight-year-old little girl was killed by a crocodile in rural Belize on Sunday afternoon, just after 3 o'clock. We spoke with Rural Executive Officer Edward Broster for the details. We got reports out of Maypen that a parent was swimming with her child. She had a, a children in the Maypen River when she observed her child Adriana Moody, eight years of age, uh, went under, and when she submerged, she was in the mouth of a crocodile. She immediately got into a canoe and paddled towards the crocodile where she attempted to hit the crocodile in the head in an attempt to have the crocodile free the child, but the crocodile submerged again and disappeared after that. Uh, this morning we learned that one resident that was downstream saw the crocodile with the child in the mouth and fired shot um, at the crocodile and that was when the crocodile apparently released the, the child and the child was discovered downstream. We went out there this morning to recover the body and take the body to the morgue um, and I, I do believe that there will be crocodile hunters in, in that area. Broster told the media that he firmly believes the reptilians should be hunted and killed as there has been a significant increase of them, particularly in residential areas. A Friday night saw Belmopan police dealing with an unprecedented case in that municipality where the head of a pastor was found inside a bucket in a pickup truck. The discovery was coincidental as Deputy Commissioner Russell Blackett explained that they had no report or suspicion that a murder had been committed. They were merely investigating another case. I must tell you that um, Mr. William Mason, who was found on Friday 15th with the head of the deceased, Mr. Lowden Lucas, was being sought for an investigation. I had briefed the HNCIB and the lead investigator looking at a specific case surrounding Mr. Mason when he was spotted 8.30 p.m. Friday in the city of Belmapan. The lead investigator was called in with the security from Belmapan. He was located at a bar in the city of Belmapan, and when a search was conducted, this is when we uncovered in a sack within a black color bucket, the head of Mr. Lucas. The forensic was called in, the place was cordoned off, and an intensive search continued within the area for other evidence and value on that scene where this head was found. I must tell you that um, when the investigator arrived, Mr. Mason explained that he could not find his key and he was very nervous. Hence the reason his driver's side window 
glass was broken, search conducted. During the course of the investigation, we uncovered that four other persons were also involved. And by 4 a.m. Saturday morning, the 16th, all persons were taken into custody. An intensive search of his farm situated at mile 31 on the George Price Highway and his home on the Intelco Hill in Belmapan was searched simultaneously for any evidence we could find. But what I want the nation to understand very clearly is that he was being sought for the purpose of an investigation. You will see while at this time they have been charged for one conk of murder, one conk of kidnapping, conspiracy to kidnapping. There will be other charges flowing through the week on other investigations that had been carried out. During the National Security Press Conference held this morning at the Belize Biltmore Hotel, Blackett explained that the motive is yet to be determined and that burnt remains of a human was found on an equestrian farm at mile 31 on the George Price Highway, believed to be that of Llewellyn Lucas. So far, we understand that there were some transactions been going on between these people. And um, it appears that there was a fallout. We are still trying to uncover the final analysis of this before we put it forward to the public. But I must assure you that whenever this is done, you will know the conclusive results. We are also continuing investigating and interviewing other persons as we speak at this time. And I must tell you that Whilst we have one count of kidnapping, we are looking at a flow of other possible offenses that have been committed. He had been tracked. He was a person of concern for us. And this is the end result. We are still trying to uncover what is in their mind. You know, criminal minds and in going deep into their heads is, is something else. What we see basically is this guy might have wronged them in some way. And this is why the extent of what occurred, occurred. But as I said, we are still investigating, and as soon as we uncover this, the public will know. The equestrian farm is said to be the property of William Mason. Four persons have been charged for Lucas's murder, namely William Alexander Mason, a.k.a. Ted Quillet, Ashton Venegas, Terence Fernandez, Ernest Castillo, and Kieran Fernandez. These men came out of the courtroom just over an hour ago with legal representation by Herbert Panton. The news from the courtroom is that the men were not arraigned and the police do not have a tight case. They have breached every imaginable constitutional rights they have. When they were detained at 8.30, these men were taken to the police station. They were stripped of their clothes. They were interviewed from 8.30 the night to 4 o'clock in the morning. They were driven from Belmopan to San Ignacio in the pan of a truck, naked. I have been up here on Saturday. It took me nine hours to see my clients. I still did not, was not able to see all of them. Went to Belmopan yesterday when I finally saw one of my clients. He was in his boxers. So it doesn't matter what kind of new policing measures the department is putting in place. All of that means not if in arriving at an arrest you are going to breach the constitutional rights of individuals. Sir, tell us about the, the identity of Mason. That's, that's the one in question. Could, we, could you talk about that? He goes by several names. Um, um, I have been retained by Mr. Mason. I know of no other aliases or, or identity as far as that is concerned. So you don't know that he's, he's under investigation? That is neither here nor there for me. As far as I'm aware, that is outside of the jurisdiction of this country. I have no power to deal with those matters. So really I, have been detained, I have been retained by Mr. Mason to deal with this particular issue and only that. Okay. Sir, the police officers also found the weapon buried underneath a pond at 
masons, la democracia farm as well, as no. well as the burnt remains of uh, Mr. Leolin. The police say that to you. They have not. There are tremendous more additional pieces of investigation that needs to happen before they can conclusively come to that conclusion. So that is nothing more than idle gossip at this juncture. The only way they can confirm that is when, um, well, the only way I will know of that confirmation is when disclosure is given and I am made aware of those facts. Okay, but you can confirm your clients all have been charged with murder, conspiracy to commit murder, no. or they have not? No, they have not been charged. Okay. I made submissions today. First of all, they came here without any facts and wanted to arraign my clients. I made uh, submissions to Magistrate, um, Ms. John, particularly that the facts that were finally brought on the face of it does not disclose any evidence for murder, conspiracy to commit murder, kidnapping, or conspiracy to commit kidnapping. The prosecutor admitted that the facts do not disclose enough evidence to bring those charges. So they were not arraigned today. Um, the matter has been adjourned to Belize City and they have been ordered to be released. So that is so where been, we stand. So 2 o'clock tomorrow um, the matter comes up again in Belize City because apparently they are saying the matter happened at mile 31 so it is in the Belize district jurisdiction. Pastor Lou, as he was mostly called, was well known and had even tried his hand in the political arena when he ran in the Dangriga by election in July 2015 against PUP's Anthony Sabal and UDP's Frank Papa Mena. As we mentioned, 46 year old William Alexander Mason was arraigned in the Belmopan court this evening. Since the news of Pastor Lucas's beheading circulated, many have been asking why. What we found interesting, however, is that many entanglements Mason have gotten himself into, and even more interesting is the fact that he had to have been facilitated in Belize in order to get his documents. We start with a website dedicated to listing persons who conduct shady business. In February 2010, a post was made with over a dozen comments from people who have been conned by him or those who have spotted him. From that site, we were led to another link that took us to Staybrook News. In an article dated January 2012, a picture of Mason was featured, where it spoke of him looking to open a $25 million medical lab. In that article, it stated that Mason, who went by the name Raj Ulet, was the CEO of an incorporation called Seven Oceans. We did come across several other websites, but what we also came across were some documents including a birth certificate saying that William Alexander Mason was born in Crooked Tree Village, Belize District, to James Mason and Sharon Tillett. In addition to that, on July 10, 2015, a police record was issued in the name of William Alexander Mason, stating he is a native of Belize with no criminal record. Notably missing from the document was his passport number. As it relates to his birth certificate citing he is from Crooked Tree, the village chairman contacted us, saying that is not the case at all. He says he has been living in the village for 62 years and has categorically denied that Mason is a product of their community. In the Starbreck News article, it had noted that Mason was born in Guyana and spent most of his life in the United States. As it relates to his aliases, we have found that this individual goes by the names of Ted Ulet, Danny Mason, William Mason and Raj Ulet. A discovery which the Deputy Commissioner Russell Blackett spoke on. No, during our investigation, that he also goes by the name of Danny Quillet and purported to be a Guyanese. His charge, therefore, reads William Mason, aka Danny Quillet. At the end of the investigation, when it comes to the <coughs> documents, again you will find that. Additional charges will be laid and it will be made known to the public. Love News understands that Mason also possesses Belizean nationality and a Belizean passport. With that bit of news, we asked Immigration Minister Godwin Hulse to comment. Absolutely not. I'm hearing the story now. In fact, 
I only heard from you, Jules, this morning that he has some vital statistic document, which of course, you know, if he has vital statistic document, then it really has nothing to do with nationality. It has to do with passports. I Meaning he would have presented that. But I have not had any opportunity to speak to any officer or indeed to, to follow up on it. But of course, knowing me, you know, I will. I, this afternoon, I'll be looking to see what information we too can have from that angle. But at this point, I'm in no position to speak. You remember that there was this Mennonite guy in Mexico who had gotten a, a fake um, vital statistics document, and that triggered. Now, we don't have any control over vital statistics. The department, ha we had put in some serious measures to deal with the nationality aspect. But if you show up with a birth certificate and you have a social security card, picture on the social security card looks good. Remember, birth certificates have no picture. So I don't know who that is. Has no fingerprint. You don't know who that is. One of the loosest documents you can ever imagine. It goes back to the days when we, we had confidence in the nation and nobody lied. Not anymore. So getting a vital statistic document seems to be very easy. The name of Minister John Saldiva has been popping up frequently since William Mason was arrested for murder. There have been reports that the minister had a very close friendship with Mason and had enjoyed certain privileges. Minister John Saldiva weighed in on those reports. Absolutely will not have any effect. I don't know who he is well connected to and I don't know what you mean by well connected. Uh, if you're asking the question if I know Mr. Mason, obviously he was, uh, is a resident of Belmopan and a businessman. And in terms of my direct involvement with him at some point last year, he had made some contributions to my football club, the Bandits, but that is the extent of it. I have not heard, of or, heard or seen Mr. Mason since September last year. We do not at this time have any friendship. As I said earlier, I have not spoken to Mr. Mason since September of last year, and I can say to you that the reason for that is because I was provided with background information that convinced me that I ought not to have a relationship with this gentleman. The same information which I believe is now being uh, seen at, on various uh, internet sites, and so uh, prior to that, no, we knew nothing uh, of, of that gentleman until that information was brought to us. He represented himself to be an upright and upstanding businessman who assisted in the community and assisted in sports and assisted in many other areas. But as soon as I found out uh, from a source uh, about his supposed background in other countries, I certainly decided for myself that, that this was not a, a useful, uh, a good thing to have a relationship or friendship with him. Certainly I can say categorically for all those who may be the conspiracy theorists out there that Mr. Mason and I, invol our involvement was only as far as sports, meaning our, our football team was concerned. There was no other uh, relationship uh, or arrangement with Mr. Mason. According to Deputy Commissioner Blackett, there will be no favoritism shown in this murder investigation. You will find that um, in the laws of interview and the laws of investigation, that anybody the police believe that could assist them with an investigation would be questioned. We intend to go all the way, just like any other murder investigation, just like any other robbery to bring the people to justice. Again, in the scripture, it says that God does not like favoritism. While reports were reaching our desk that phone calls were made to the senior officers to have Mason released, Blackett says he did not receive any and he had been present from the onset of the investigation. Prior to his death, Pastor Llewellyn Lucas had been making some posts on his Facebook referring to a house at number 13 Cayo Street in Belmopan and asking Minister John Saldiva for help. He had also posted about being jilted of money from the St. John's Credit Union. Saldiva spoke on this issue. I have not read his, his, his site. I, I will not get into the details of what I, what I know about his issues with his, within his family. Those are, are family 
issues, I believe, if, if that is the same thing you are talking about, but they had absolutely nothing to do with me. I know that he had made a public plea for me to help him in his family uh, dispute over uh, the house, but I did not see it fit for me to get involved in a family matter. At the opening of the 2016 hurricane season, the Belize City Council had made a presentation on their plans for search and rescue. During that briefing, William Mason had done a presentation on the issue and spoke of his group's role in aiding the National Emergency Management Organization. Today, Councillor Philip Willoughby spoke of Mason's participation. At the launch now of the 2016-2017 hurricane season, we have to do the preliminaries to check that our committees are where they need to be. Um, and that team, again, was present at the launch. So it happens that he made a representation. And you keep in contact with these groups or individuals to see where you are and so forth. So they were invited, and he gave a presentation. But let me say this, and this is the emphasis. He himself, or the group, the search and rescue group, is not within the formal structure of NEMO nor the City Emergency Management Committees. They are not a formal part of that. What they do, as I said, they provide a support or a volunteer aspect with a commitment to assist. And it is with that view that this group was involved. Okay? So it's not to say that there is anything beyond what the group seeks to do in a time of disaster where search and rescue is concerned. And when they come, they came fully prepared and ready. And, and that is it. Now, in the area of knowing who is what and who is who, sir, like I said, they came as a group and referred to us. So I don't think it's within our purview you now to look at the credentials of individuals or so forth. If that was the case, then an EAPB should have been put out or a warning should have been put out to notify us about the said individual or others or any other group at that. But in a time of a disaster, people are rendering assistance and want to help. While it is not in his jurisdiction, Assistant Commissioner of Police Chester Williams spoke of the callous murder of Pastor Llewellyn Lucas. I would just say it's a heinous act and um, I'm sure that the police will do what needs to be done to be able to identify those persons who are responsible. I would say it's a heinous act and um, I'm sure that the police will do what needs to be done to be able to identify those persons who are responsible and bring them to justice. And uh, I would hope that those persons who are circulating the head of the pastor on the social media, that they do some soul searching and ask themselves the question, if it was them or a relative of theirs, would they like or would they have liked to see the head circulating on social media? We must learn to respect the grieving family. And uh, when we do things like that, it does not help the grieving family. It opens new wounds every time they look at those pictures. So I would advise that they take them down. Williams stated that as gruesome as Lucas's decapitation was, it does not signify a trend in the upscaling of crime, but that it is a matter of an isolated crime. A team of experts have been deployed to conduct an independent report on the incidents that surround the death of a Guatemalan miner, Julio René Alvarado Ruano, on April 20, 2016. According to the Embassy of Mexico, the decision came as a request from the governments of Belize and Guatemala. The Independent Commission will consist of specialists in the fields of criminal investigation, criminal law and forensic affairs. The team is also well versed on the mandates of the OAS and fluency in English and Spanish. The investigation is expected to last approximately two weeks, but if necessary, it could be extended for another two weeks. At the end of the two weeks, the team is expected to deliver a single report representing a detailed and independent investigation. Additionally, Belize requested expert investigations of other cases in which Belizean security officers were injured. 
in the aftermath of the miner's death, tensions escalated as both governments sent accusations at each other. This independent report is expected to facilitate dialogue and strengthen confidence-building measures. Invitations to compromise the team were sent to Brazil, Chile, United States and Mexico to nominate experts in criminal investigation. It was necessary to recruit members from these countries as the OAS has limited financial resources and personnel. Originally, the United States and Brazil confirmed their willingness to join the team, but later on Brazil withdrew. Therefore, the OAS Secretary General would seek the support of other member states. The Mexican Federal Police PF appointed Dr. Patricia Rosa Linda Trujillo Mariel, head of the Coordination of Criminology of the Scientific Division. The activities Dr. Trujillo will be undertaking several important tasks in order to cooperate, witness statements and find the necessary evidence to find out just what happened. As our newscast was winding down on Friday, we had received reports of a robbery at the Income Tax Department just after 5 o'clock. We had reported that over $30,000 was taken in that robbery and that police were on the case. Love News spoke with the Deputy Commissioner of Police, Russell Blackett, on the investigation. We understand that about shortly left of 5.30, there was an armed robbery at the Income Tax Service in Bamapan. The police responded and found a police officer tied up along with the other members in the office. Um, about three or so gunmen went in and a total of about $29,000 were taken. We so far have one main suspect and he's been served. Any other details in terms of, because obviously the offices were closed because it was after after 4.30 and any kind of surveillance footage as a lead? Again, yes, we have cameras, we are looking at that. Uh, we know that they used what appears to be tactical uniform used by the MIT and the JSU. But so far it does not seem to be those. It appears to be from what they brought from either outside from or from across the border. Do you suspect that this has um, internal working? Again, um, I would not want to make any comment on that, but when we investigate, we look at all um, levels to see whether or not that is so. Police are currently seeking one person for questioning. 36-year-old Amilcar Tulsi, one of nine persons charged with drug trafficking and two counts of possession of a controlled drug, pled guilty to the charges when he appeared today before Senior Magistrate Sharon Fraser. He was sentenced to three years and was fined $10,000 for drug trafficking. He was given until December 31, 2016 to pay that fine. If he defaults on payment, he will serve another three years. He was sentenced to three months for each count of possession of a controlled drug. The sentences are to run concurrently to each other and concurrently to the sentence of three years. The charges were withdrawn from the others who included two men and six females, among them two minors. The incident occurred around 8.45 p.m. yesterday. The police members of the GSU went to a house located at mile 9 and a quarter on Philip Goldson Highway to execute a search for firearms and drugs. The police reported that when they searched the bathroom, they found four grams of crack cocaine, and when they searched under an ironing board, they found one gram of crack cocaine. The police conducted a further search, which resulted in the discovery of another gram of crack cocaine, which was under the largest sofa in the living room. Last Friday, as chaos unfolded in Istanbul, Turkey, in all the confusion a delegation of Belizeans transiting through were stuck at the international airport. Martha Carrillo was one of those Belizeans who were en route to South Africa to attend the International AIDS Conference. She was traveling alone when her flight was canceled and she was stranded at the airport. Anna Carrillo, her sister, was in contact with her and spoke of Martha's ordeal. She was the only one that was in Turkey. Um, she was traveling alone. Um, she was going to en route. She was transiting to reach to Durban, South Africa for the International AIDS Conference. 
she informed us early in the morning on Friday morning that she was in Turkey and then what happened during the time was that she was on a 10 hour layover before she could in transit then to um, to South Africa um, an hour before her flight um, everything just happened and at that point um, my brother calls me and he said have you been listening and, and watching the news I said no and he said well something is happening in Turkey and I don't know what's going on but we're trying to get a hold of my sister Anna Carrillo also spoke about what the atmosphere was inside the airport where people were demonstrating and security was on a high alert. She did mention that there were pro protesters inside the, the, um, the airport mm -hmm. and that security was high. So basically what happened was that she had to sit there um, for about 16 hours or thereabout before they could have find out what was going what what she had to do um, basically what happened was that she got stuck inside the airport mm -hmm. she had missed her flight or the flights were canceled and getting back on a on, on another flight was difficult from from there to go to South Africa so um, at that time already the Ministry of Foreign Affairs during the time when the chaos was going on the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the British High Commissioner were, were notified of the situation and um, we were in communication with them. They had alerted the embassies and consulates in, in the area. Mm -hmm. um, we were notified that they couldn't have done anything in Turkey at that time because they were the, the whole city was shut down. 16 hours after Martha Carrillo was able to get on another flight and her sister Anna Carrillo says they owe it in large part to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the British High Commissioner who worked tirelessly to assist her stranded sister she was scared um, mostly it at the first it was a lot of confusion because even for us we didn't know what to do where to start and our close friend was she was like well we need to, to, to alert the authorities and that's how we got the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as well as the British High Commissioner so that they know what's going on there um, mm -hmm. and they assisted and we have to say thanks to them that um, you know to their quick response in a couple of hours and I said 16 hours, but it was 16 hours of when it started to when she had to leave. Um, but she did say it was a lot of chaos, a lot of people crying. Um, her main concern was, I just need to get out of Turkey. Anna Carrillo stated that they are trying to secure a return flight for her sister that would not transit through Turkey. Love News had spoken with the chief executive officer, Lawrence Sylvester, who had informed us that the ministry was in communication with the Belizean and that they had informed the Belizean personnel posted in London, Brussels and Istanbul of the situation who would be on standby to extract her at the earliest time possible. Today in a trial without a jury in Court of Justice, Adolf Lucas Gilbert Martinez charged with attempted murder was acquitted of that charge. The incident occurred on April 21, 2011, through an alley that runs off Banach Street. The complainant, Joseph Makul, testified that he had a misunderstanding with Martinez and Martinez attacked him with a machete and some pint bottles. Makul was stabbed five times in several parts of his body, which included the left near his rib cage, his chest and his neck. After the prosecution closed its case, attorneys Michelle Trapp, Zuniga, and Beja Schumann submitted that Martinez does not have a case to answer because the identification parade was not properly done, and as a result, there was no identification evidence. Justice Lucas upheld the submission and acquitted Martinez. The Crown was represented by Crown Counsel Janely Tillett. Two men, 19-year-old Police Constable Wallace Main Jr. and 21-year-old Trevon Chi, were charged with attempted murder when they appeared today before Senior Magistrate Sharon Fraser. They were also charged with dangerous harm, aggravated assault, and use of deadly means of harm. They were remanded into custody until September 7th. The incident occurred shortly before 9 p.m. on Thursday, July 14, behind the complex building in St. Martin de Porres area. The victim, 29-year-old Nigel Castillo, reported to the police that he had another person 
were at a Chinese shop when he found himself in the middle of an argument with some young people. He said to avoid trouble he left, and while he was on his way home, he was shot in his lower abdomen. The gangs, however, are not the only ones who will feel the brunt of this new approach, but even the police officers who are affiliated gang members will be dealt with. From our neighborhoods and communities and place them in jail, and from being able to influence and entice our youth into a life of crime. The GSU will be strengthened and expanded to be more effective in intelligence gathering on gangs, in analyzing gang trends, in identifying problem areas, and in consistently targeting these most violent gangs in order to reduce gang-related crime and violence. This new focus of the GSU must bring with it a zero tolerance for police abuse and brutality, but will see swift and firm and effective enforcement in a manner that respects the fundamental rights and freedoms of all citizens. I intend to meet with the entire unit to relay that message in person, and I have asked the commissioner to ensure that they continue to video record all their operations. With the GSU coming to the forefront regarding the mitigating of gangs and gang violence, there will also be the addition of human resources on the streets. At the same time, we intend with immediate effect to increase the number of police officers in the known gang-ridden areas of Belize City. This will be done through the redeployment of officers from other areas in the first instance, and then through the assignment of new officers from the recruit squad set to pass out in October. I suspect there may be some who are skeptical about our response of putting more boots on the street, especially since we have been steadily increasing our numbers since 2012. However, we have carefully studied the situation in the gang-infested areas and I have identified specific gaps in the surveillance of those gangs and need to be filled with more boots on the street. These additional officers will assist in keeping a steady eye on the gangs as they move around the city and provide timely intelligence for effective interception of weapons as they are moved around for the commission of crime. You may already have observed over this past weekend that the police have stepped up their operational presence in the gang-ridden areas of Belize City, especially also around the entertainment areas and the tourist zones. The Inspiration Center has donated to the recovery of a teenager in Punta Gorda. Paul Mahang tells the story. A teenager of Toledo who was recently seriously ill received a needed donation as he continues gradual recovery at his home. Through the support of the Inspiration Center, Christo Maas, who fell seriously ill in May, received a helpful donation and continues to receive essential therapy as he gradually regains normal health, as explained by Toledo Rehabilitation Field Officer for the Inspiration Center, Andrea Koch. The donation of the wheelchair from the Inspiration Center was indeed a big help for 14 years, Christo Mas, who took in seriously ill in May. His diagnosis was a case of Guillain-Barre syndrome, which left him with a flaccid paralysis affecting his movement and use of hands and feet. After receiving needed medical treatment at KHMH, he returned to PG Hospital for about a week and thereafter returned to his home in San Marcos on June 8th. Up to the time he left PG Hospital, he was still paralyzed and confined to bed, and so was the need for me to accompany him on the ambulance to his home. At that time, I took along a wheelchair, contributed to Christo from the Inspiration Center, and also began the evaluation and therapy. 
I also taught Crystal's family member how to assist in doing the therapy on a daily basis. It has been long hours of therapy treatment with the direct assistance from family members and myself. Crystal has progressed from lying in bed with assistance into the wheelchair where he sits and wheel himself around in the house and now outside of the house. Crystal Maas, who is hopeful and determined to regain normal health, remains grateful. I would like to thank Ms. Andrea Cock and the Inspiration Center for giving me this wheelchair, which is a big help for me to move around easily. Along with his family and Crystal's hopes for his total recovery, the family remains very concerned and in need of financial assistance to pay the balance of Crystal's medical bill at KHMH, amounting to $84,651.25. For any appreciated kind assistance, Crystal's sister, Manuela Chuck, who is in charge, can be reached at four numbers, 605-0567 or 637-3102. Reporting for Love News, Paul Mahong, Ponagorda. Our thought conditioner for today is from Dieter F. Uchdorf. It reads, quote, Healing comes when we choose to walk away from darkness and move towards brighter light. End of quote. This has been the Evening News on Love Television, and we invite you to log on to our website at www.lovefm.com for transcripts of our news stories. Thank you for joining us. Have a safe and enjoyable evening, and we'll see you tomorrow. With your Evening News, I am Taryn Butcher.